All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ken Tuff. I'm a principal engineer at Intrinsic Software. At uh, Intrinsic, we provide engineering services for hardware and software integration. Um, we work with um, manufacturers, commercial, industrial, ODMs, uh, to bring products to market. Uh, so that's commercial devices, industrial devices, as well as working with uh, silicon vendors on reference platforms, for example. I've been a technical lead on a number of our reference platforms and also on some of our uh, uh, commercial products that we've assisted customers with. Um, Linux, Android-based uh, e-readers, for example, like the Nook that we worked on. Yes? Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it probably shouldn't uh, say uh, confidential on there. It's this, you know, this will be on the website and all the, all the um, information will be on the website. <coughs> so uh, what I intend to cover is uh, from a general uh, system perspective, I've worked on a sort of a, from a system engineering perspective on uh, a number of systems, like I mentioned, the uh, Android integration. So I'm, I'm familiar with a number of aspects of the system, um, especially as it relates to performance and stability and um, things like charging and, and various uh, things related to the storage. Um, in this uh, talk, which was also uh, presented during the Android session, a number of th the uh, Investigations related to the file system were done by a senior engineer, David Boxfoldy, who's uh, at Intrinsic. And uh, if there's anything in that specialist area that I can't answer, then you can forward questions to our contact details, and maybe we'll follow it up later. Um, <clears throat> so what, what I had planned to talk about was uh, generally what, what's special about an EMMC. What is the EM EMMC? Uh, as a, if, if you look at it as a black box, uh, the things inside the black box can have a real effect on the performance of the system, so we'll kind of dive into that a little bit and look at various uh, levels throughout the system where things can be done to address the performance. And uh, I'll, I'll try and make some breaks in the middle there so that people can answer some questions, so if you can hold them off until we get to those break points, then we can maybe talk and discuss at that, at that point. <clears throat> right, so uh, what is the an EMMC, well, it's basically solid state storage. So it's, it's like a block-based device. It, um, the concept is to make a, you know, a black box that provides sector-based storage that you can uh, mix and match on your system. And it's got a fairly simple interface then. It sits on the MMC uh, bus. Uh, it's a chip, usually, that's mounted on the PCB. And they come from various different vendors, uh, you know, Samsung, SanDisk, uh, Hynix, various different manufacturers. Inside, there's usually uh, a memory array that consists of one or more dies that are usually NAND flash based. And they take care of a lot of the uh, management of that NAND. So you only have to think of it like a disk drive. But uh, in terms of a, a, a black box that looks like a disk drive, it has very different performance from a disk drive. So EMMC is, is popular on a, a lot of different types of embedded devices because, as I mentioned, uh, it's a cheap way of working with the NAND. It's uh, flexible, and you can change the components, increase the storage capacity quite easily just because you can uh, scale up to a larger size chip. So in theory, it's, it's quite a generic way to work with the storage, and you can select ones from any vendor. And if they uh, work with the JetX spec, then functionally, uh, you should have a ma matching part. But I say in theory because uh, there are a lot of things that are kind of vendor-specific. Vendor <clears throat> uh, the NAND takes care, the uh, MMC, EMMC, takes care of a lot of the handling of the NAND, and we'll, we'll see that in a minute. So uh, the different scenarios where you might have it mounted uh, all relate to sort of a different environments for using the MMC, and that can relate to... Uh, aspects of the performance. So things like tablets and smartphones typically have a lot of DRAM. Uh, netbooks also would have lots of DRAM. Then there might be e-ink based e-readers or other types of product where you might have less DRAM and, and, and those present a, a few problems. Um, multimedia players and USB sticks typically would be cases where you'd have uh, very little memory and that's not really one of the areas where we were focusing here. So 
most of our background around the, the performance for MMC was for the Android use cases, and, and that's really where we had been focusing our uh, investigation effort. So if you look inside the black box of the MMC, this is typically what you would see, something like this. Uh, manufacturers are very protective of their proprietary information, so they don't really talk much about the structure. But in general, there's some block-based uh, NAND. So they, these are erased, uh, arranged in erase blocks, which could be anywhere from 2 megabytes, 4 megabytes. Those are the erase blocks of the NAND. Um, and that's managed by some form of a microcontroller of some type which has internally in the chip its own firmware, so the MMC has its own firmware inside, some SRAM to do its operation, and also, depending on the structure of that NAND, as, as the uh, geometries for NAND evolve, you don't need to worry about that external to the MMC, but there are things like some fast caching so that uh, they can respond to say, yes, I've taken your written data, and they can respond quickly because it gets written down to fast cache, but if there's some NAND technologies that are slower where the, the data is actually stored, um, you know, three bits per cell or whatever it is, and it's slower write times, then it can come out of the fast cache and the microcontroller can take care of, of putting it into the NAND. So um, the microcontroller maintains a mapping between the logical sectors that you're dealing with from your system point of view and the pages in NAND. So the NAND is arranged in erase blocks, and if you know about NAND memory, um, you have to write individual pages, but to erase, you have to erase the entire block. So if you're writing a sector to this device, and you write that same sector a number of times, the microcontroller will actually map it to different pages within the NAND erase blocks, and it'll maintain that logical mapping between the uh, sector you're working with and the uh, page in the, in the NAND block. And eventually that, that erase block is going to fill up and it's going to have to shuttle it off somewhere else so that it can erase that, that erase block. And uh, that piece of, of handling when it needs to shuffle all the bits of data around in the background is, uh, is, is a kind of an internal housekeeping that it does. And uh, that internal housekeeping is when you can see some real hits on the performance of the MMC. Um, <clears throat> so, this uh, just generally talking about that, uh, we've got NAND erased in, in, uh, arranged in pages and your uh, microcontroller there. The microcontroller maintains the mapping as, where is the w as well as the where leveling, so uh, if you're writing the same sector many, many times, it'll shuffle that off to other erase blocks in the system to make sure that you get a consistent number of uh, writes throughout the different erase blocks that are available in the array. Um, and it manages the free space within the device. <clears throat> so uh, if you look just generally on the characteristics of the MMC, what you'll see is that uh, it has a fast read access time and a fast read seek time. So the seek time is almost zero. If you think of it like storage and we think of it kind of like a, a disk drive, it's effectively a disk drive that has zero read seek time. Um, it has an acceptable sequential write performance. So Nowadays, they, I mean, they started, this data was on five megabytes a second for a sustained write transfers, but, uh, you know, they, they can go uh, faster than that now for se sequential writes, but they're very poor on random write performance. And uh, that's really because of that, that housekeeping and, and the need to switch um, the mapping to internal erase blocks. And so manufacturers have various ways around that and various heuristics that they use to improve that. Um, and often they'll have a number of uh, simultaneous pipelines. So if it's doing some housekeeping on one of those pipelines, then it can go and uh, accept writes for other blocks. So you won't see it as a hit on performance on the chip every time it needs to do internal housekeeping. but. Uh, it, it, it is a significant factor. So, in terms of that internal housekeeping, there is an MMC command, which we call the trim command. And the trim command's purpose is to tell the MMC, hey, I'm not using those logical blocks anymore. I'm not using those sectors. Because otherwise, any time you've written a single sector and you've written one byte to a sector, the MMC thinks that's gold and it can't lose it. It can't corrupt it. It's got to maintain it. And if it ever needs to erase the place where that data is maintained, it's going to have to shuttle it somewhere else. Now, if you've got a big file and you delete the file, 
you don't really care about those sectors anymore, so the MMC shouldn't spend its time doing housekeeping on those blocks. And by using the trim command, you can, you can tell the MMC, uh, yeah, I don't want to deal with these anymore. They're not, they don't really contain valid information, so you can just go ahead and do an erase on that, that uh, region without having to first shuttle the data off and rearrange it. And that can probably increase the performance that you can see because the, the internal pipelines aren't, aren't tied up managing that data. So you can see that you could do that trim command uh, on formatting, for example. Um, it's not the same as an erase command on the MMC bus level because an erase command uh, is actually performing something different. It's saying, okay, I want to uh, do a secure erase. I want you to wipe out all that data that was in there. Be sure that it's gone. It can't be accessed again. Uh, and I want you to return probably something uh, known like zeros or whatever from those sectors. So, so there, uh, there's a different concept. <clears throat> So the specified performance that you'll see for these chips typically emphasize um, the sequential write performance. So they'll say they can handle 5 or 20 megabytes a second, but they don't really talk very much about the write performance when you're doing random writes around the chip. And um, <clears throat> it's those random accesses that really hit the MMC uh, internal pipelines, and, and, and we'll see in a minute a couple of graphs of uh, some typical access times. Um, so that is, the, the access times that you'll see are frequently limited by the MMC's random I.O. per second rate. So you can actually get that rate if you ask the manufacturers and you press them on it. They'll tell you what sustained rate of I.O.s per second can you get from the chip, especially if those I.O.s are spread across the whole chip. Um, and they'll typically be somewhere in the range of a couple of hundred I.O.s per second at the moment. So that doesn't matter whether they're... 50 Ks or 512 bytes, you'll only just get 200 of those per second. So there's a certain amount of headroom that you get independent of the size of transfer you're doing. And then, of course, on top of that, you have the data transfer time over the MMC bus. <clears throat> so it does scale a bit linearly, but for a lot of use cases, you'll just be hit by that I.O. per second rate. <clears throat> so what we can do is analyze um, the read and write patterns on the MMC bus in terms of your application and in terms of what's happening while it's in the system and in terms of how does a particular chip use it. How does a particular chip sorry, uh, provide, um, provide timing on the MMC bus? How does it handle those sectors you're trying to write down? So um, first of all, we'll just look at the, uh, the lower level, which would be the MMC itself and the block device. What can we do in that area in terms of optimization? And then we'll have a look at uh, the block device and I.O. scheduler, a little um, uh, bit of a look in there. Um, some more detailed data on the file systems and um, some, some data that we've had in running some experiments at that level. And then very important is, is what can you do about a, from the user space and your applications and Android in terms of, uh, uh, as an example, application um, in terms of optimizing the performance. So uh, does anyone have a, any quick questions just on the first part? If not, we'll just keep rolling. Where's the ECC? The ECC is maintained within the, the controller, so you don't get access to that information at all. And uh, you know, we have actually a lot of experience in terms of data corruption as well that we've seen, and we'll probably talk about that, <coughs> maybe get to that in terms of the microcontroller. But the microcontroller provides what, some services to take that sector of data and write it down, and you expect it to come back totally intact. And if it can't bring it to you intact, it should give you an error, an I.O. error. But that's not always the case. And if it doesn't give you an I.O. error, there's nothing you can do about it. But um, it, it's not unknown for that to happen. <coughs> I'm sorry? The bad blocks? Yeah, the bad blocks also would be maintained and uh, done by the microcontroller itself. So it'll drop out. Um, erase blocks as they uh, get a number of failures. You know, if, it's, it's, if it sees that you has had too many bit flips on that, that erase block, it'll take it out of the picture. And normally the manufacturers will reser reserve something like 7% of the storage of the die as uh, spare erase blocks. So that's another factor for vendors. They might tell you, you've got an 8 gigabyte chip. Now, did they start with an extra 7% of erase blocks, or did they take those away from? And, and they do do it differently. So I mean, some manufacturers will give you 8 gigabyte, 97, 93% of 8 gigabytes is all you really get as user storage. 
So, <clears throat> um, but that's a good point. Those things are maintained internally in the chip. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in terms of the MNC driver level, uh, you're going to want to uh, maximize your bandwidth on it, make sure you've got uh, full the maximum speed enabled, you've got an 8-bit wide bus, uh, DMA if you have access to it is turned on. Um, there's other things that uh, you can do on the MNC bus level uh, that probably affect your system. There's certain uh, degrees of power management, for example, the sleep command on the MMC bus would, will tell the chip that you're enabling it to power down and that's very important if you want to power off your system. Uh, because of this internal caching that's in the chip, you have to make sure that the MMC isn't doing his housekeeping at the point when you pull the plug. And the real way to do that is to give it a command to say go to sleep and when it responds you know that everything is safe. Or you can rely on the manufacturer's uh, internal uh, power management where they uh, say, okay, if you haven't had any IOs for one second, then you should be okay to take the power off the chip, that sort of thing. Um, there's the other commands like the trim command, our uh, support for that is, is optional, so it's, it's not always supported and it doesn't always improve performance. For some manufacturers, it might actually make it worse. So it's, it's worth checking out those different levels of uh, of um, vendor specific commands. In terms of power management, another one is the power class of the device. So in terms of the SD spec or the MMC spec, uh, they'll start up in a certain power class so you know what kind of power they consume. But if you allow the chip to consume more, then the processor, for example, can run at a faster clock. The internal controller can run at a faster clock or um, the, you know, they can uh, improve the, the the uh, headroom on, on some of the I.O. transfers and what you'll see is faster, uh, faster transfers down to the device. So that really affects, for the most part, the bandwidth to the chip and not so much affecting the things like the internal housekeeping that's going on. Now in order to get some good measures of what happens at the uh, driver level, we inserted a, a logging device that just logs into RAM and it's got a circular buffer so that we could get an idea of the time taken to execute transfers on the MMC bus and the size of chunks. So it's what chunk are you transferring, reading or writing, and how long in milliseconds did it take for that to execute from the MMC command until you see the response to that command. So if, for example, a multi-block write, when you initiate the write up until you give the command 12 to, to stop the multi-block write, that amount of time. <clears throat> so uh, when we did some really high level uh, benchmarks here, these were actually done on an e-reader device. Um, doing some different use cases where you're, you're reading a book or you're surfing a web or you're doing some random kinds of accesses on the device. In fact, if you look at the graph, which is a histogram of the number of sectors per chunk written or read against the, no the count of those uh, times those numbers of transfers happened, you'll see that it's really biased towards the, the, the page cache, the individual 4K chunk. And that's the prime primary number of transfers that go on here. So even though vendors will say, okay, you're running Android, that's most of the stuff you'll be doing is sequential reads and writes. A person copies a file down or they play back a MP3. It's really a big sequential read or write. It's not really true. I mean, this is the distribution that you'll end up with for the most part, where the, the big bulk of your transfers are going to be 4K out of the page cache. Um, and you, get, you do get a, a, a different uh, number of larger transfers there, and some of them can be very large, but for the most part, those small transfers are really affecting the system. Just or this is reads and writes, yeah, reads and writes. Um, so here's a diagram of the, uh, the MMC bus times that were taken from the logging driver in terms of the read chunk size from zero up to about uh, 512 kilobytes here, 1,024 sectors. And the scale is just from one, uh, zero to about 25, 30 uh, milliseconds there. So, oops, there. Zero to, to 30 milliseconds. <coughs> yep, I think we've got out of sync here. Uh-oh, that doesn't look good. 
Shouldn't be running Windows, I think. Let's try this again. Sorry, I'm going to have to skip forward. Okay, I think this is just a very slow rendering page or something. Right, uh, this is write times now. So if we look at the number of uh, writes that are going on in the system, um, you can see that, and, sorry, there's something going wrong with the, the, uh, the display of that graph. But anyway, from, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the number of writes, the, uh, you, you can, let me just try and get it back up again. You can really see the housekeeping effect because um, at uh, the scale on the, on the milliseconds there is going from zero milliseconds up to two seconds, in fact. So the baseline across the bottom is the number of transfers that are taking place at sort of about uh, 50 milliseconds. So that's what we saw for reads. But then when the housekeeping takes place, it's typically up to about 400 milliseconds that you'll see a block on the MMC bus. So there's nothing else is going on for that 400 millisecond time. And that's really where we see the big hit on performance. So what happens is if you've got a 2 megabyte write going down or a 512 byte write going down, it doesn't matter. It's still going to take that 400 milliseconds. It can hit that, that 400 millisecond level. And then there's some real outliers there as well. So... Um, what we will see when we look at the file systems <coughs> is uh, that they're really affected to a large degree by this uh, housekeeping that's going on there. And uh, the, the fact that small writes can, um, can take a, 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 a large uh, amount of time can, can really impact what, what file system you're using. Right. So. Um, there are some other aspects to the MMC bus as well, which is like the high priority interrupt that's, a, that's coming in an MMC v4. We didn't actually look at that data. Um, that is a thing which allows reads to bypass a long write, but really that's allowing a read to in intersect or come in when you're doing a multi-block write that you can actually go in and pull the read out quickly while you're doing that multi-block write. It doesn't actually say that if if the MMC is involved in some of this long-term 400 millisecond housekeeping, that it's going to give you the data very quickly. Uh, we'll see when we talk about the cache that uh, really reads are not our, our primary concern because uh, the reads from the chip, the, as you can see from the timing, they're very quick. Um, and if you've got a large amount of RAM, hopefully your reads are going to be supplied for the most part from your block cache and they're not actually going to be going to the chip unless you're using like an ODRAC type of access. They'll be <coughs> supplied for the most part from your block cache. So that's one thing that we really want to uh, emphasize is to have enough, enough RAM to work with your, to supply your block cache with uh, page cache, with, with pages that it can uh, satisfy the reads. <clears throat> okay, so that was the MMC device and the block device. Um, I think I better jump forward to the block device and the IO scheduler. Um, again, cache, really important. Uh, it alleviates a lot of the write performance issues and it can improve your read times even further. And of course, it'll reduce your NAND wear if you, don't, uh, if you allow the block cache to be large enough to coalesce writes or um, if we don't have to write down to the media and do sync, sync writes. So sync writes are the very uh, thing that is really going to cripple the system. Yes? System page cache or cache inside of the NMT? This is, this is uh, system page cache. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is system RAM. Um, so if you're doing a lot of writes and they're happening all over the system and you've got a long enough delay um, before those go down to the chip, then of course it can coalesce those into some bigger synchronous writes, uh, sorry, bigger um, coalesced writes. And 
because it, we're, we're talking about a, a certain amount of time that takes place independent of the transfer size, it doesn't really matter to us if we're transferring 128K or if we're transferring 16K. In a lot of cases, that'll take approximately the same amount of time. So allow that to coalesce as much as possible in the, in the uh, page cache. For I.O. schedulers, I.O. schedulers were typically developed for um, disk drives. You know, in the original days, kind of uh, elevator algorithms where you're thinking of a uh, disk turning and you've got a certain seek time that it's going to take for you to seek from one cylinder to the next one. So you can put those, th those parameters into an I.O. scheduler and uh, tell it, you know, there's a penalty for doing a read, that you should be able to do a certain amount of read ahead. What we uh, could do is use an I.O. scheduler, for example, to tell it that there's a certain penalty for switching between erase blocks within the NAND. So if you're jumping over four megabyte boundaries, then there's a penalty. Uh, what you really want to do is to tell it that there's a penalty if you're jumping for a right across those uh, erase bounds. Um, we did a lot of different uh, tests with different I.O. schedulers, um, you know, fair queuing, no op, deadline schedulers. And for the most part, the results that we saw were, were the same within a, about a 10% range. Um, Largely, it's quality of service uh, con considerations that's important. So, for example, if you've got multimedia playback, you're going to want to have uh, a large buffering in your multimedia playback so that yeah, you're, you can have a big degree of read ahead. But um, th those are the things that are, are going to be more important than just sort of uh, sustained throughput to the MMC. But it's possible that, that there might be places to investigate in terms of making better I.O. schedulers tuned for an MMC. Because an MMC was made to look like a disk, but it doesn't per perform like one. So maybe there's a, some, some improvement to be made there. So that's uh, the, IO the block device and the uh, I.O. scheduler. We can probably jump into the, the file system, and, and there's uh, quite a bit of data that we've got in there. Um, do, shall I just uh, stop there and ask if anyone has any question or discussion on that point? Till then, yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I think in the end, I think we um, settled on CFQ, but it, it might be better in certain times within the system. So, for example, on uh, booting during initialization, it seemed like there was probably a, a better sequence of um, a VIO scheduler to be using during the boot, and then you can even swap your IO scheduler later as, as you move into different use cases. I think that's, uh, that's really what we, we had seen. I mean, there's one, one typical problem is while your system is initializing for the first time, it's doing a lot of database activity. If you're using Android, for example, it's doing lots of uh, SQLite work, which involves a lot of 4K writes down to the disk, and the, the, the defaults are that that's going to be a synchronous operation, and, um, and that can really slow down the system if it's interleaved with a lot of very big write, uh, reads, for example, and sort of trying to shift where those things are happening. Um, can improve some things, but it's just going to delay a lot of the other stuff, like the readback. So it, it's difficult to, to, to sort of find a good way of mapping that um, to the use case of the system. Uh, I, I meant optimizing a, a block scheduler for a specific EMMT. Yeah, we didn't, no, we didn't, we didn't uh, actually try to take a, uh, make an optimum I.O. scheduler yet, no. So I think that's, that's a place where someone can do a lot of improvement, if you, if, unless you know of one. We, we tried it for deadline. We failed to mm -hmm. see a Okay, okay. <clears throat> uh, so in terms of file systems, uh, we, in, in terms of the analysis, as I say, uh, our engineer focused on the, the right performance and ran a, a whole series of tests on some different file systems, so ext3, ext4, butterfs, and nilfs. Um, and uh, I'll present some slides from that. They were run on a, an, a, a tablet-type device of 8 gigabytes MMC and 512 meg of RAM. And uh, they had various um, low-level and high-level scenarios using uh, FSBench. Um, the choice of file systems kind of revolved around what we were actually using because of the Android environment, but also the theory that uh, NILFS, for example, might be better because it, it does a lot of reading and writing in chunks, uh, large chunks, sort of being a kind of log-based file system. Um, so see how that operates. Uh, and see how the, the ButterFS uh, file system works as well in comparison to the XT4. 
So here's an example of the file system benchmarks. It's, again, it's a pretty uh, busy slide, but the slides will be available without the confidential there. Um, so um, they're arranged in four groups of bars, and that is showing uh, on the left the multiple writes, that's multiple threads, uh, four threads doing reads, uh, sorry, writes, four threads. And uh, the second one is a single thread doing the, the writes. And then on the right-hand side, again, multiple threads and single threads, but synchronized, synced to the disk, so with a sync operation going on. So this, the, the write has to complete to the medium. And what we could see on this initial benchmark is uh, <clears throat> that uh, in these two megabytes, so these are two megabyte writes, so big, what's considered big writes, um, the EXT4 uh, is doing pretty well uh, on those uh, transfers, and the ButterFS is really uh, doing especially well in terms of the multi-thread writes and uh, any of the writes without sync to the disk. But if you're syncing to the disk, then uh, the NILFS and everything in general is much slower. <clears throat> Now, when you move from there to 16 kilobyte writes, what we see is a really different picture, and, and there you can really see the impact of, of any synced writes. So asynchronous into the page cache, here's your difference. Um, the ext3 uh, and ext4 are performing well. So the one, if we look at the, uh, the, the individual bars, on the left is ext3, next to that is ext4, uh, with and without discard and journaling, and then ButterFS uh, with discard turned on and discard turned off, or that's the trim command effectively, and then the last two bars of the NILFS. So um, on the 16K writes, um, we can see there that, uh, again, in terms of the uh, async stuff, the ButterFS is doing well, um, but when it comes to the sync things, it's really the EXE file systems that are doing better off in that area. And uh, when it comes down to single sector writes, um, the impact of the, the sync is, is even worse, uh, is a huge impact on the system. And there, it's really only the EXT file systems that are, that are of any use, really, uh, at, at synchronous one, one sector writes. <clears throat> Which EXT were you running? Uh, I'm not, you mean which vendor? I don't, I don't really know if I could say that right now, so I, we can talk about it later maybe. Um, so, and this slide here is showing us some synthetic workloads. So the um, FS Bench was set up to simulate some situations. The, what first is kind of like a mail server, it's small file, read, uh, writes, and then next to that is a, is a file server where it's doing large file, opens and closes, reads and writes. <coughs> now, a web server where it's a variety of file reads and writes, and uh, I believe one of these involves also a lot of uh, truncate operations. And the last one there is uh, simulating an Android boot uh, situation where it's doing a lot of reads as well as um, some uh, uh, synchronous operations simulating a, a database activity during boot. And uh, looking, for example, at the Android situation, Android boot situation, uh, the no journal ext4 with discard turned on is looking the best. And you might say, well, why have no journal? Um, that was just to really drop out some of the uh, factors of, of what happens during the system when a, when a journal is, is, is taking place. Um, because of the layout on, this, on the disk, your journal is typically not going to be in the same places as your data node, your inodes or your data uh, sectors. And so that having a, a journal really gives you random accesses to the disk. So when you're writing to a journal, you're going to be hitting one place, and then you're forcing the system to put the data somewhere else. Um, one way around that on a system like a tablet with a fixed battery, if you've got a, a fixed battery, you can think of that system as, as really being a, a system with UPS. So it's possible that you might be able to run this system with uh, journaling in RAM. If that RAM is available through, for example, a kernel crash, you can recover it that way. If it's also flushing fairly, uh, fairly often, then maybe it's not really all that critical. A lot of the data is probably just cache data, for example, on a, on a, uh, a pad device. Um, it may be just cache data. So how often does that system actually uh, crash? 
You know, uh, how often does the kernel panic? That's really the only situations when the system, the power is pulled, is when the kernel panics or the, um, uh, the battery dies unexpectedly on you. So that comes back to sort of having effective system power management um, and being able to recover a log through, uh, through a reboot of the kernel if the, you do happen to have a panic. So that's, that's one option is to, uh, to really consider whether you do need journaling, in fact, on that system. Um, for comparison, this is a slide of uh, ODirect reads, first on 2 megabyte, then on 16 kilobyte, and then on 512 byte uh, chunks. And you can see it's basically bottled out the system. So we, we could see that on the initial graph of MMC timings, where really it only just varied between 0 and 25 milliseconds, and it was nice and linear with the size of transfer you were doing. You've, you've, you've maxed out the MMC here anyway. So um, it's not really showing you anything special. It's showing you that writes are really your, your problem in your system. So we could dive further into what um, the individual uh, <coughs> file systems do on the MMC, and we'll just cover it very, very briefly. Um, so on ext4, when you perform a write, and if this is a journal file system, you'll typically have a journal write, which is usually a 16K chunk, so that's one of the reasons that size was chosen. And then an inode update, which is usually a single um, uh, chunk out of the page cache, usually 4K going down. And then the data, which typically on, a, on an asynchronous write, of course, will go into the page cache and eventually get flushed down to the to the disk. <clears throat> uh, on ButterFS, you, you, you would see uh, that the updates for uh, async are, are very quick. So it was, it was actually doing very well for large files on async transfers down to the disk, um, where a synchronous write puts, forces the tree leaves onto the MMC, and, um, and then has a, also a synchronous write has four non-sequential writes. So it's, it's, it's really impacted by, on those small transfers, it's really impacted by uh, synchronous writes. Um, NILFS, again, is a kind of a log-structured file system. So it's, it's any changes in effect are written down as big chunks. So you would expect that because they're large sequential chunks that are going down to the MMC, that uh, it might be quite effective for an MMC device, but in practice it didn't show up that way. It, it, it didn't really show up well at all. Um, even a, a, a 512 byte write is stored, usually uh, it ends up being one big write to the disk, uh, which is about uh, 40K or plus, and uh, it forms all these snaps, uh, forms all these log updates, which eventually need to be flushed out as that fills up. <coughs> coalesced together into a new snapshot of the file system and written down to the disk. And that period when that happens is really going to be a bad time on your file system. So it, it doesn't end up being a, a, a potentially good option. And then also you have to think about um, recovery during initialization when it has to replay all those logs to get the current state of the file system on top of it. Um, read is, is, is generally very good, so it, it may not be too bad at that, but um, it didn't really prove to be an effective uh, system. More, more interesting academically, probably. <coughs> Again, the EXC4 file system without a journal. Um, if your system has a fixed battery, if you're flushing your cache and your, your page caches and you're flushing your um, uh, uh, system fairly often, um, it might not be too dangerous. Um, consider whether you really need it. Consider how big that partition of, of uh, important information needs to be. Or even in a system design, you might think of storing that, that journal somewhere else and not on the same, ch same chip, because it's that journal that's really hitting you in terms of getting those random writes. So if that journal was actually stored on a different medium, that would, that would really improve things. Um, and one way is to store it into RAM instead, and, and RAM that's preserved through a kernel, uh, a kernel reboot. <coughs> Um, in terms of ButterFS, it's, uh, if you're not doing synchronous writes and, and you're doing lots of uh, big transfers, then it's, it's very good. And so um, it might be good for something like a, a Linux-based video camera, for example, if you're doing uh, writes that way and you can write them asynchronously. Um, so that, that, that would be a very good uh, opportunity for it but it would be very poor for something where you're doing a lot of very small file accesses and you've got to uh, 
maintain the sync to the disk for security reasons. <clears throat> um, and, and especially it's good performance if you've got a, a number of multiple writers uh, at the same time. And NullFest we already covered, in, in theory it should be good, but it, it, it really wasn't that, that fantastic. <clears throat> so um, if you're using ext4 with a journal, um, consider storing it in the RAM. Uh, you can tune your journal flush timers so that that uh, uh, journal is played back into the uh, MMC uh, at appropriate times or, or is done on a basis knowing about the housekeeping of the MMC and how frequently those writes need to go down. So, so keep them at a relatively long time, especially if you've got a battery-backed system and it's, uh, for example, something a user can't remove the battery. Um, and it's, in fact, uh, better than ButterFS for, for the small and the medium synchronous writes. So in general, for your file system, uh, you want to have it laid out with, uh, you know, you don't want a system with a swap, virtual memory swap. Uh, that's really going to give you a big problem if you want to be using it to the MMC. Um, then you might want to consider aligning your uh, partitions with erase block boundaries. And this is now where you want to dive into that black box again and figure out where are those erase blocks in terms of sectors. So if you use sectors and you say, OK, I'm going to align every four, four megabytes of sectors and I'm going to align my partitions on those, is that really going to help? Well, it, you have to really talk to the MMC ve vendor to know if that's the case and if it's really going to help in terms of uh, getting aligned to the erase blocks. EXT4 was a, is better than EXT3 because um, it had the concept of these uh, extents where you can use them for doing the trim command. So whenever it needs to go and get a block of data or a sector to, to add to its data um, uh, chain of data blocks, it'll grab it from one of these extents. And then when, when you delete data, it will uh, end up freeing up one of these extents and then it can actually perform a, a trim command across that whole region. So um, being able to do that and match those up to the erase blocks in the underlying NAND is, is especially effective. And then once again, the system design, where your storage is. I mean, typically, if you're, you're going to have a big MMC for cost reasons, and everything is going to get thrown in there. So you've got a read-only system partition, for example, with your system files, and then you're going to have a data, and maybe a cache area, and maybe some other kinds of uh, manufactured data or other kinds of things. And uh, some of those are only read, some of those are only write, uh, or, or, for example, for logging. And, uh, and then you've got your data partitions. So when you're doing activity on a, on a data partition and you're doing some writing, you get some random reads happening somewhere else in, in the chip in order to get to the system data. That'll really affect the, uh, the performance of the chip as a whole. So you might want to consider multiple storage devices for storing pieces of, uh, different pieces of, of data. <clears throat> and that would really be important on a, you know, a, a kind of a real-time system. Uh, where you're trying to get consistent performance out of the MMC. And so finally, uh, we get down to the uh, user space uh, after talking about the file systems. And uh, in terms of what you can do at the user space, uh, again, as much as possible, avoid synchronization or uh, sync writes down to the medium. So for example, uh, look at your database handling if that's requiring it. Uh, whatever kinds of tuning you can make in that area. Um, avoid doing um, uh, sync operations in your, uh, your services or servers and try and batch up transactions as much as possible rather than uh, doing individual small transactions down to the disk. Um, and uh, generally avoid small writes. I mean, it's better to buffer them up, for example, in a, in a multimedia service program, you know, you're Get a, get a large buffer. The larger buffer, the better. <clears throat> and so in terms of uh, where we could go from here, um, the Lenaro project was working on uh, improving the MMC experience. So you can talk to the people there. I, I understand that they, there's some work going on for better file systems um, for EMMC. Um, EMMC 4.5 brings a thing called metadata, which allows you to tell the MMC, sort of dive into the black box more again and say, hey, the data that I'm giving you is related to inode. So for example, it can do different things uh, with that um, piece of, it, of data that you're writing down or manage it in a different way. 
And uh, I don't really know much about the last one. I think uh, it was mentioned in the, the Linux talk at the, the beginning, um, some of the dirty page throttling. Uh, that sounds interesting to me in terms of when those uh, pages from the page cache get written down to the disk and being able to throttle that and uh, have some control over when that goes down to the disk. That sounds very important. As well, uh, I didn't put it on the list, but another thing is, again, the I.O. scheduler. Maybe uh, an improvement to the I.O. scheduler uh, with keeping the uh, structure and architecture of the MMC in mind would really uh, improve the overall performance of the system. So, uh, in summary, we've kind of looked at all the different areas, what the MMC is, uh, and what you can do at the block MMC driver level. Um, that you know a lot of caching is is good in terms of your block device. So if you're talking about an Android device and you've got a lot of RAM, do you really want to throw it at all all at the applications, or is it better to have more kind of underlying the applications in in the in the page cache and those things rather than having it sit on applications that in fact aren't even running? Um, and then. A lot of things you can do in terms of uh, selecting the appropriate file system and especially structuring your applications uh, in an appropriate way. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in terms of the file system, ext4 was probably your best bet. Um, especially consider the discard and try it with uh, different chips from different vendors because using the trim command doesn't always give the same performance uh, across different chips. Um, Consider whether you need the journal or not, or whether you could store it in RAM. Um, try out some different configurations of the MMC, um, you know, sizes or from different vendors or multiple chips. Um, perform a lot of benchmarks, especially at the MMC level. Benchmark your situation, your, your application and, and how it works in the system. I mean, are you writing large chunks of data or, or not? You might not actually be... Uh, doing the transactions down to the MMC that it seems like you might be doing from the application level. And then uh, have a look at what vendor commands your kernel supports and what you're us actually using in the system and what your file system is able to support. And uh, in general, just kind of avoid writing to it. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we can stop for some discussion. Yes? I'm, I'm a comment on that. Can you go back oh, to yeah, that? sure, sure. This one, all right. We've done very similar analysis, not that one yet. Yeah. Um, first of all, ext4, we found that it's pretty good if you have um, a good EMMC device. If you have something like an SD card, especially a bad SD card, ButterFS has a significant advantage over ext4. Okay. Um, so the, the, if it gets, uh, for really bad devices, the big difference, the better the device gets, the, the smaller the difference. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Because you can have EMMC partitions where you tell the device that this partition is going to use SLC storage instead of MLC. Oh, you can actually tell the chip. And, yes. Okay, so I, I don't know if everyone's ever able to hear. Um, <coughs> yes? No, if you're Okay, so um, yeah, maybe you want to finish your point and then I'll, I'll, I'll just echo it back a bit. Um, I, will, I was finished with that. Okay, okay, so uh, the, the point, uh, this point was that uh, on ext4, um, it's, uh, sorry, on ButterFS, the performance can be very different depending on the, the speed of the device. If you've got a very poor, is that, is that right? It was, no, is ButterFS on a poor? We found it never to be worse than ext4, but on, on, on bad devices, it's much better than ext4. Oh, yeah, sorry, ButterFS was better on the slow devices, like uh, poor SD cards, than ext4 was. Um, and that's interesting. And then the other point is that for ext4 file system, you can actually tell it, like I mentioned, storing the journal on a different device, you can actually store it to a different partition on the chip, and then you can structure it with vendor commands in such a way that you tell the chip, hey, I want to store um, that this partition in SLC memory, which is uh, faster to, to write, than MLC data uh, memory, which is going to take longer to write small pages. So there, there might, you might be able to actually break down the chip into different regions and <coughs> control them in different ways and say, I'm going to do lots of small writes in this area, so I'm actually going to tell the chip that this is an area where I'm doing my small writes. And uh, it'll man the microcontroller inside will manage its storage in that way. So again, it's really peering into the black box of the chip, and if you want to just deal with it as a simple um, 
block storage device, that's fine, but you're not going to get your squeeze the last ounce out of it. If you want to do that, you're going to have to dive down into the chip and start telling the chip what you're doing with it. Yes? If you want to, what are your options to, to, to do swap to an MMC? Um, uh, well, uh, we, have, we are looking into rewriting the swap allocation code for that so it won't okay. destroy your device. Okay, so this is, uh, you're with the Lanaro project, right? So you're looking at, at, at looking at the swap allocation, right? You're saying? So, so that we are always writing the swap pages in the, in the right order so we never. Right. Okay, so, that, so they're looking at re rewriting the swap allocation so that it's, it's written in the right order and, and you don't get into a situation where it's kind of thrashing the chip if, with... Uh, <coughs> yes? Um, okay, so, so uh, the MMC uh, driver itself supports um, uh, some hooks in there to the file system. And um, I, I'm not really familiar with the exact link between, for example, the, uh, the XD4 when it frees up a, an extent and, and executes the, the vendor command. But um, it needs to be implemented for your... Um, for your chip in the, in the MMC bus driver and, and host controller driver and card driver that you're using. And uh, um, not all the kernels support all the various different commands. So for example, the state machine governing the, uh, the power handling with like the command five, uh, I know you need to have something about a 2632 kernel to, to have that uh, command handling in there. But then it's taken care of for you by the MMC driver. Okay. I guess uh, if there's nothing else, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much for attending.